Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We're going to finish up our looking at the false Christs of the past. The idea that Satan has set up a different Jesus since the moment he first appeared in the Garden of Eden. He's introducing, he the serpent is introducing another gospel to Eve, is what he's doing. Because if you think about what the gospel is, essentially, it's not, a just, it's not just about turning a person to a religion called Christianity. It's about the ability to bring us from death to life, immortality, everlasting life, life that never ends. So, Think about what the devil promised Eve in the Garden of Eden. Number one, ye shall not surely die, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So that essentially is the same thing that we're headed toward, only we know that we can't do it by our own power or by eating some magic fruit or anything like that. We know that it has to be done through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the grace of God, through our faith in what God said. So the devil introduces this false gospel. He's got to have a savior to go along with it. And I want you to remember now, as we go into, we're going to study two more, two more guys, two more dying gods, who want to be resurrected from the dead again, and a little bit about their religion. As we study these, I want you to remember that Satan said to Eve that your eyes will be opened. Now, we know that practically everything the devil says is a lie. So when he says, you shall not surely die, he was lying, and he knew he was lying. When he said, your eyes shall be opened, he was lying, and he knew he was lying. He knew her eyes wouldn't be open. They would be closed. It's just the opposite. Like, and why don't you, why don't you think of this in the Bible now. People who are awake versus people who are asleep. What did Paul say about it? 1 Thessalonians 5. We are children of the day. We're awake. We're sober. They that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunk are drunken in the night. We know, according to 2 Thessalonians 2, that at or about the time of the appearing of Jesus Christ, God sends a strong delusion, very powerful, very strong delusion, causes people to fall, literally, and I do believe that. I believe that literally, they're not just going to fall from grace. I believe literally just as drunks, when they get so drunk, they can't stand up, they fall down. People who are slain in the spirit, what do they do? They get drunk and they fall down. In the blue lodge, the first three degrees of masonry, they beat the guy on the head relatively, symbolically, and he falls backwards, just like slain in the spirit. Wonder where they got it from. And then they use the strong grip of the lion's paw. And it's like this. I watched two guys do it. Strong grip of the lion's paw to bring that man back to life again. Okay? You're going to see that today. Let's get into our scriptures, Matthew 24, verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall shew great signs and wonders. Don't forget that. Insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, I've kind of rearranged things a little bit. 1 John 2.18, 1 
1 John 2, 22, 1 John 4, 3, 2 John 1, 7. We have the mentioning of the Antichrist and the fact that the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. Has since Genesis 3, the spirit of the spirit and the setup for the Antichrist has been around since the beginning. It's already been working in the world through these myths of these dying gods that were sort of like the sun, the sun rising, going down. We studied that, and we're going to look some more at that again today. But the idea of the dying god going down, the sun going down in the west, going into the lower parts of the earth, who's down there now? It ain't Jesus. It's his mirror image, his false image. Antichrist is down there. Then 2 Corinthians 11. And I want you to remember what the, uh, the number 11 represents. Because I, I think this Bible just, it just looks like it's in order to me. It's like a Marine sergeant doing an inspection of the barracks. He can tell when those barracks are in order and when they're not. He can tell. So you can put on a white glove and go to the Bible. You're not going to find any dirt. All right. The number 11 represents confusion. Mysteries that are not revealed. Things that are hidden. Chaos. Unknown. Like should I say it? Unknown languages. Gibberish. Babble. Blah, 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 blah. That's what it represents. You go back to Genesis 11. That's what you'll find. This other gospel that accompanies this other Jesus and the spirit that comes with it is meant to deceive you into thinking that if you receive this spirit that you'll have grand illumination but you won't you'll be so drunk you won't be able to stand up and you'll have this grand stupefaction you will literally have a strong delusion on you second corinthians and remember second corinthians 11 is where satan is transformed into an angel of light. So are his ministers, his apostles, as ministers of righteousness. Well, that's confusing, isn't it? Absolutely. 2 Corinthians 11, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. In other words, don't let any of these Christ's touch you. Stay away from them. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So, let me introduce to you the first character. We're going to look at two today. The first character we're going to look at is a god by the name of Dionysus or Dionysus, or we can simply call him Dion if you want to. Notice that Dion has a great big what in his hand cup. Now, from everything we've studied about Babylon, what do you reckon's in that cup? Drunkenness, fornication, craziness, fire water, right? Knock them out John stuff, right? Everclear. Okay? That's what's in there. There is a picture, the picture there to the left Dionysus has another name, Bacchus. And the feasts 
of Bacchus were these very dignified, <coughs> formal, you know, black coat and tie, you know, bow tie with claw hammer coat tails and ladies all dressed proper sitting down using the salad fork first and then the dinner fork and ladling the spoon away from you as you eat your broth and no, that's not how the Bacchus feasts were done. They were dancing on the table, stripping their clothes off, getting drunk, throwing food at one another, and doing a lot of other things that go along with that. In other words, the Bacchus feasts were drunken orgies. That's what they were. It, they, they were exactly what Israel was doing at the base of Mount Sinai as Moses comes down with the two tables in his hand. They were having a Bacchus feast down there. Take a look at that picture. I mean, you've got guys drinking, carrying big barrels of whiskey, women nude and dancing and rock and roll music. Look like a rave party to me. That's Bacchus or Dionysus. His, the, the God that he represents, he's the God of wine and drunkenness and revelings and riding in the daytime, everything that Paul said, riding in the daytime, feasting and being out of your mind crazy. So every drunken party that's ever been had in the world, the spirit of Antichrist was there. Every drug party that anybody's ever had, where everybody's doing coke, marijuana, they're doing meth, whatever. Every drug party, every wild dance party, loud banging music party, Spirit of Antichrist was there. And oddly enough, that's become what some churches are now. Oddly enough. Because the, the difference between, let's say, Dionysus, Bacchus, and Christ is that he represents this God who died for the benefit of others and is awaiting resurrection to give something to the people. And so that's the Christ that's presented in these churches, but they honor that Christ with the loud banging music, everybody dancing, everybody acting stupid, bodies slain in the spirit, bodies laying all over one another in an immoral fashion. That's not the Holy Spirit. Get real, people. Here is the Wikipedia article. Dionysus is the god of the grape harvest. Stop right here. Revelation 14, verse 9. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. Mm, this Bible, it's got it all. Amen. He's the God of the grape harvest, wine making, and wine of fertility. Well, we know what that is. Orchards and fruit, vegetation, insanity, ritual. Madness, religious ecstasy, festivity, theater in ancient Greek religion and myth. Got to stop right here. Religious ecstasy. More than one person has received some sort of ecstatic experience in a church service where maybe somebody touched them on the forehead. I remember a guy I went to church with. We were taking communion and he said that when he drank it, he just felt this 
like electricity all over him. And I know what that means. God's called me to preach. He never did preach. Never did. Last I heard, wasn't even living for the Lord. Now, I'm not his judge. Maybe he is now. Hopefully he is. But people replace these feelings for the Holy Spirit. They think that the sign that the Holy Spirit has come on you is that you get this ecstatic feeling. Well, let me tell you, Percocet will do the same thing. Wine will do the same thing. Methamphetamine, cocaine, beer, if you drink a lot of it, I guess. Those will all do the exact same thing. So that's not the sign that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, but that's what it's been replaced with. Because I felt this ecstatic energy through me, that must be the Holy... I must be selected by God. I'm special now. And I was talking with somebody this morning about people who pretend to exhibit gifts of the Spirit. And let me tell you, and I won't say it for everybody in every instance, but let me tell you that generally the people who talk about their gifts, what they've done for God, how they've experienced God, and on and on and on. That's a spiritual cover for some really deep, nasty sins. So they intend to cover it up. I met a guy one time, I was doing a prophecy club meeting down in Alabama, I think, and in Mobile. And this guy, this was after 9-11, not just a couple years after 9-11. And before the meeting, everybody's talking, you know, and this one guy, he reminded me he looked like Elvis. That's all I can remember. Going around from group to group, and I can hear him bragging. God showed me 9-11 before it ever happened. God showed that to me. I mean, he showed me everything that happened, 9-11 before it ever happened. And I caught on to what he was doing. He was there. He had him some kind of little get-together church. He was there to bring people over to him. He was there to recruit. He was there to brag about how he was God's chosen man, that God thought he was so special that he gave him this vision of 9-11 before it ever happened. And the only question I had was, why weren't you there filming it? Why weren't you there warning everybody before they went in those buildings? How dare you receive a vision of 9-11 knowing exactly what's going to happen and do nothing about it but brag that God showed it to you? Number one, I don't think he ever had such a vision. Because anybody could wait till something happens and then say, yeah, God showed me that. Now I knew that was going to happen. It's a spiritual cover. It's for people to look good and act big and act like God's mighty vessel when they ain't nothing but a dirtbag, scumbag sinner like me. So religious ec ecstasy, festivity, insanity, ritual madness. Altered states of consciousness, laughing in the spirit, slain in the spirit, acting like drunkards, how people howling like wolves and barking like dogs. And one lady in a church, I won't describe her actions, but she's being intimate with Jesus in the church. That's not, see, if, if it's a different Jesus, it's a different spirit. And it brings madness, it brings insanity, it brings this ecstasy, and people get hooked on, just like they get hooked on drugs, they get hooked on that. And the problem with it is, the more you get this Sunday, the more you have to have next Sunday. 
And churches that feed this to people have to put on a bigger dog and pony show the next week or they can't keep those people in. It'll leave them like they've ate a big bowl of Rice Krispies and an hour later are starving to death and their blood sugar drops. Used to do that. So that's Dionysus, that's Bacchus, that's not the Holy Spirit. He is also known as Bacchus, the name adopted by the Romans. The frenzy he induces is Bacchaea. Another name used by the Romans is Liber, meaning free. You know, like when people used to go to nudist colonies because they wanted to be free, right? Due to his association with wine and the bacchanalia and other rites and the freedom associated with it. So the drunkenness wasn't just, hey, have you ever tried this stuff? It's good. It was done in a religious ritual. So I never did understand churches using real fermented wine for their communion when specifically on the day of Passover, God said, I'm not going to find any leaven in your house. Am I? So they're drinking wine that's had leaven added to it to ferment it. And again, it's sad. When a drunkard's first taste of liquor was in his church's communion service. That just doesn't make sense to me. In his religion, identical with or closely related to Orphism, Orpheus, there's a piece of classical music called Orpheus in the Underworld. You can find it on YouTube. Dionysus was believed to have been born from the union of Zeus and Persephone. Zeus, a god. Persephone, a woman. Who is he? See, and, and you see how the, how the other Christ issue comes in here. Christ is the son of God and the son of man born of a human woman. Only God didn't, the Holy Spirit entered into her and conceived in her. She was still a virgin. But the sons of the gods thing or the, the sons of God thing in Genesis 6 with the daughters of men, all of that was a setup to replace Jesus Christ by these half gods and half human, these giants. Dionysus was believed to have been born from the union of Zeus and Persephone and to have himself represented a chthonic or underworld aspect of Zeus. Many believe that he had been born twice, having been killed and reborn as the son of Zeus and the mortal Semele. You understand that chthonic, Thing, don't you? The underworld aspect of Zeus. As above, so below. Whatever Zeus does here, Orpheus or Bacchus or Dionysus does the opposite. It's like particles that are quantum entangled. See it? Since he's in the underworld, what does that make him? Here's what Manley Hall said. The birthplace of Bacchus called Sabazius or Sabaoth was claimed by several places in Greece, but on Mount Zelmissus in Thrace, his worship seems to have been chiefly celebrated. He was born of a virgin on the 25th of December. He performed great miracles for the good of mankind, particularly one in which he changed water into wine. He rode in a triumphal procession on an ass he was put to death by the Titans, the giants, rose again from the dead on the 25th of March. He was, also, he was always called the Savior in his mysteries. He was shown to the people as an infant is by the Christians at this day on Christmas Day morning in Rome. Drop my hat. The devil set this up years ago. The idea that he was to be born of a virgin. The idea that he was going to have a triumphal entry. The idea that he's related to a cross 
of some kind. And yeah, we'll see that. But he's setting up the false Christ. Notice that it says in his mysteries, he was shown to the people as an infant is by the Christians at this day. So literally all over the world, they found these statues of a woman holding her God baby or nursing the baby somehow. Here's some different representations of it. Oh, by the way, check this one out. A serpent mother holding her little serpent baby. Dun, dun, dun. So now we know who he is, don't we? Okay. I mean, that, this looks like one of those draconian dragon, reptilian aliens that you hear people talking about. I watched a video where a woman got up, made a speech, is on one of these UFO YouTube channels. She was invited to speak to tell her story about how she was taken on board one of these alien ships, met all these different aliens, and there was one who was the boss of all the aliens. He was this big, large, nine or ten foot tall, I don't remember, lizard looking guy that had to be, his name was Drax, or she called him Drax, Drax from Draco the dragon. And she had to call him like Lord or Master or Sir or something like that. She had to give him reverence because he was the big honcho among these alien devils. And she said there was a couple of occasions where she was taken to the ship and got to hold her little dragon reptilian looking baby. I would like throw up all over that thing. But she actually fell in love, not just with the baby, the dragon that gave her conception. Now, I, I don't know if she's telling the truth or not, making it all up. She got paid for her appearance. Some people are just crazy enough to make up stories like that just to be noticed. Okay? I don't, I don't understand it, but they are. But we know from Genesis 6 that before the flood, after the flood, and Daniel 2 in the end times, that's going to happen again. So all these images of a Madonna holding a baby that doesn't have to be Jesus. That Those are images, I believe, of the Antichrist. Now, the last one. One that was brought out prominently in the Zeitgeist documentary. Remember I told you about that, that it goes into detail about all these different religions that had a Christ figure and how he you know, was born of a virgin and how he did this and that, that matched Christ and how he did that and that was like Christ and he died on a cross and rose again or is going to rise again someday and that Christianity made all this up based upon that. But it's exactly the opposite. All of these things either were invented or occurred to set up the idea that Christianity is nothing more than one of these religions. After all, that's what Manly Hall believes. That's what Albert Pike believes. That's what's taught in the mystery religions is that all the religions are basically the same. They tell the same story, even Christianity. They don't believe Christianity is supreme above all religions. They believe it's like all of the other religions because of the idea of setting up a false Christ. Well, Mithras seems to be like the chief of these. And there's a couple of images of Mithras that I'm going to show you. Get ready for this one. This is Mithras. Lion-headed, humanoid body, wrapped in serpent DNA. You see the caduceus down on the bottom, which represents human seed DNA. Notice on the right-hand picture, the carving, 
What he's standing on? Cross. So think about the, the combination of all this. The cross, the pole, the serpent entwined, part human, part lion, the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of his bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. So he is, according to verse 18, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, beast and man together. And that's Mithras. Here's what Manly Hall said about Mithras, the Mithraic rites, the Mithraic uh, rituals that they performed, and where they performed them. This is interesting. Initiation into the rites of Mithras. And, and let, me, let me stop right here. We don't have any initiation ceremonies. We don't have any rituals where we wave our hands or our rod over somebody, tap them on the shoulder. We, we don't have anything like that. When a person is saved, how many rituals do we have to perform to make sure he's saved? Salvation is on the inside. It occurs by the killing or the crucifying of the mortal flesh and the conceiving of a new man on the inside of us. That new man is what's going to come out on the day of our rapture or our resurrection and be our new body. That's, and no ritual of any kind can give that to anybody. Not baptism, not communion, not saying magic words and waving hands in front of people, not touching them on the forehead, nothing of human origin can give that to somebody. Paul said in Galatians, Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Was it a ritual under the law? Or was it someone read the Bible, heard the verses, and believed it, and God filled him with his Holy Spirit? Now he's born again. That's how it happened. The hearing of faith, not some ritual somewhere. And I don't care what church it is. You, you might be thinking, well, the Catholic Church, yeah, they do rituals, and the Episcopalians, and they do it, and the Lutherans, they do it. And... But I'm talking about some of these deliverance ministries. Well, they've got a prescribed ritual of things you must do in order to get this devil called cursing. I, got, I curse real bad and I can't stop. And I, oh, I've got a devil of cursing and it needs to be cast out? Oh, okay. Let me tell you what that is. People blame spirits as an excuse for their bad behavior. Well, yeah, I, I hit my wife, but it's a spirit that's in me and it, it has it. It needs to be cast out, then I won't hit my wife anymore. No. That's just your bad behavior. That God needs to, God needs to take a rod to you for a while and chase that out of you if he can. Initiation into the rites of Mithras, like initiation into many other ancient schools of philosophy, apparently consisted of three important degrees, like, like in masonry. Preparation for these degrees consisted of self-purification, the building up of the... See? Self-purification versus the Holy Ghost purifying you. Again, you can tell the difference by whether or not they require works. And in this case, self-purification. I've never asked anybody who's ever come and said, I, I want to be saved. Go home take four baths a day, eat no food for three days, keep everything clean and pure, watch no television, 
think no dirty thoughts. When you come back and have purified yourself, then we can convert you. Never said that to anybody. Makes me mad. The building up of the intellectual powers and the control of the animal nature. That's not possible. You, if it's an animal nature, you can't control it. In the first degree, the candidate was given a crown upon the point of a sword and instructed in the mysteries of Mithras' hidden power. Probably he was taught that the golden crown represented his own spiritual nature, which must be objectified and unfolded before he could truly glorify Mithras. For Mithras was his own soul, standing as mediator between Ormuzd, his spirit, and Ahriman, his animal nature. In the second degree, he was given the armor of intelligence and purity, sent into the darkness of subterranean pits to fight the beasts of lust, passion, and degeneracy. In the third degree, what are you giving me the third degree here? He was given a cape upon which were drawn or woven the signs of the zodiac. Those are the beasts that are in the stars, people. Signs of the zodiac and other astronomical symbols. After his initiations were over, he was hailed as one who had risen from the dead, was instructed in the secret teachings of the Persian mystics, and became a full-fledged member of the order. Candidates who successfully passed the Mithraic initiations were called lions and were marked upon their foreheads with the Egyptian cross. Drop my hat. You see it now? With the other Jesus is another gospel and another spirit. You see, only then can they learn the secret teachings. And by the way, where are they? They're down in a pit, aren't they? Mithras himself is often pictured with the head of a lion and two pairs of wings. Throughout the entire ritual were repeated references to the birth of Mithras as the sun god, his sacrifice for man, his death that men might have eternal life, and lastly, his resurrection and the saving of all humanity by his intercession before the throne of Ormuzd. It's like the devil read the Bible and went, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, we'll, we'll throw that in there, too. Oh, yeah. And came up with his own corrupted version of it that requires works, requires a performance on your part, requires ritualism of some kind, makes demands on you when it tells you you must control your animal nature. Well, that's built into our wicked flesh you can you can no more control that than you could before you got saved it's wicked depraved still to this day wicked and depraved and it's going to rot in the ground and no cape given to you can change that you see, you see, do you see the symbolism of the cape the cape is a covering we have put on Christ, not a cape. We've put on Christ so that when God sees us, who does he see? His beloved son, Jesus. Mm, love it. Now, again, last week I, you know, I told you that guys didn't just invent Quetzalcoatl. They didn't say, right, let's see, let's make him look like a snake. Yeah, that's the thing. We'll give him feathers. And these are things they saw. So let's look at this picture of Mithras again. Human body, lion headed. Do you know that's in the Bible? There was two of them. Second Samuel 23, 20. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. 
And who are these guys? They're David's mighty men. All of these men, plus David, and I think Joab, I think if I, I, I'm just trying to remember a fact, I may remember it wrong. It seemed like there were 31 mighty men of David, plus Joab, plus David. 33. I may be wrong on that. But the idea was that all of these mighty men are pictures of Christ. That these guys are the ones who killed giants, and so on and so on. They won the wars. They defeated the enemies in battle like Christ did at the cross. So here is uh, Benaiah, one of David's mighty men, who killed two lion-like men. Now, if the sons of God and the daughters of men got together after the flood, which they did, and they can create giants, which they did, why not also different characteristics of different spirits mating with human women create literally humanoid lions? Two lion-like men, beasts and man together. After all, this is about the time of Goliath. So we know that these monsters were in existence at that time. Then he says, he went down also. If I see a lion down in a pit, I'm very content with leaving him there by himself but I'm not Benaiah. Benaiah, it's snowing outside, sees a lion down in a pit, says, I want to kill that rascal, and jumps down in the pit with the lion. That's a mighty man of God right there. And kills him. That's a mighty man of God. They all took after David who was a mighty man of God. Who Remember, David took the lamb out of the lion's mouth. So again, where did this invention of Mithras come from? That he had a lion head and a human body. I think they was real. I think these God men were on the earth and some of them looked that way. Um, the influence of Mithras, still around to this day, I remember in high school, um, the, the Rankin Bass made a cartoon of The Hobbit, J.R.R.R.R.R.R.R. Tolkien's book. And I saw it and I, I thought, wow, that's cool. A mythical place called Middle Earth and you have these hobbits and you have dragons and you have a ring and you have a wizard. So I was going to church, I was in Sunday school at that time. I was studying the Bible. But that was fascinating to me. So I got the book out of the library and I read it. Then I found out about Lord of the Rings. Read all three of those. Learned all about it. And there was just something about the names of some of the characters in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings that it sounded like I had heard those names before. And Understand that Tolkien was a student of uh, myths, legends, ancient religions, and things like that. He was very well versed in them, especially of some of the Nordic myths and tales like Beowulf and stories of Mithras and Odin. You have a character in the Lord of the Rings called Theoden. Theos is God. Odin was the God of the, the Norwegians or the Nordic people. Wotan was the German God, same God. So I recognized Theoden. Then I remembered that Gandalf the wizard from Lord of the Rings had different names among different people. And if you look up Gandalf like on Wikipedia or some of these other uh, 
in, there, there's a whole encyclopedia built around the Lord of the Rings characters that tell you all about them. Gandalf was born of a particular type of people who just were born with magic in their hands. So when Bilbo Baggins knows Gandalf and first meets him in The Hobbit, he's Gandalf the Grey, and he wears a gray hat, got a gray beard, and gray clothing, and he does wizardry, and he's a good guy. He's a really good guy, because he's against the bad people, the bad wizards. Well, in The Lord of the Rings, something happens. Gandalf the Grey is fighting this real bad, mean, evil beast demon thing. I forgot what his name was. And they both fall down into a fiery pit. And Frodo Baggins and all of the other guys, they're afraid Gandalf is dead. Oh no, what are we going to do without Gandalf? We need Gandalf. Well then, lo and behold, Gandalf rises back up out of the pit and he's been transformed from Gandalf the Grey to Gandalf the White. White hat, white beard white glowing robes. He's the, the God-man that was reborn. You see it? Well, one of the names, the elves didn't call him Gandalf. The elves called him Mithrandir. Where did that come from? Tolkien knew the stories of Mithras. And that's was the basis for the character of Gandalf. So don't tell me it has no effect whatsoever on how people see the world and how people see religion today. Because it does. Not only do you have people all over the world who just follow Tolkien and they know all about it and then all these other fantasy things, Dungeons and Dragons and things that have crept out of that. Then you have books being written, you know, uh, finding Jesus in Harry Potter, finding Jesus in Lord of the Rings. And Paul said, or Peter said, we have not used cunningly devised fables in declaring unto you Jesus Christ. So it's an anathema to use mythology to show people the truth of Jesus Christ because all you're doing is showing them the other Jesus. Manley Hall said this, It is possible that the Masonic ladder with seven rungs had its origin in this Mithraic symbol. This cult is another ex excellent example of those secret societies whose legends are largely symbolic representations of the sun and his journey through the houses of the heavens. Mithras rising from a stone is merely the sun rising over the horizon or as the ancients supposed, out of the horizon at the vernal equinox. He then goes on to say, the rites of Mithras were performed in caves. Why? Why were they performed in caves? What was the significance of the caves? Periphery in his Cave of the Nymphs states that Zarathustra, or Zoaster, was the first to consecrate a cave to the worship of God because a cavern was symbolic of the earth or the lower world of darkness. John P. Lundy in his Monumental Christianity describes the cave of Mithras as follows. This cave was adorned with the signs of the zodiac. Where, have we see, where do we just hear that from? The people who are going through the rituals are adorned with a cape with the signs of the zodiac. The 12 gods of the heavens, right? Cancer and Capricorn, the summer and winter solstices were chiefly conspicuous as the gates of souls descending into this life or passing out of it in their ascent to the gods. Cancer being the gate of descent, Capricorn of ascent. These are the two avenues of the immortals passing up and down from earth to heaven and from heaven to earth. Now, I got, does that ring a bell to you? If it doesn't, I'll show you what it means in a minute. But this idea of, that is all bogus. We worship in a cave because we want to worship God in truth. Really? In a cave? What are you, nuts? He's not in a cave. What did the angels say? Behold, he is not here. 
He is risen. He's not there anymore, people. Why well, go down in the pit to worship Jesus? You go down in a pit for the same reason there's a special well in Iran where they believe the 12th Imam, the savior of Islam, is going to return from. He's in a well, a pit, the underworld, hell. Who's down there right now? Revelation chapter 9, verse 11, and they had a king over them. By the way, I didn't mention that Bacchus, Dionysus, Dionysus, was a male-female god. He was the androgynous god. He had male aspects and female aspects, like Baphomet and like their faces were as the faces of men and they had hair as the hair of women. See it now? So these devils in Revelation 9 that are in the pit have a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Now this is interesting to me. Why does it have to give his name in both languages? Hebrew, Greek. One possibility, Hebrew has 22 letters. Greek has 24 letters. Add those two together. 46. Remember what I said last week? That in me dwelleth no good thing. Remember the 46 words that Satan spoke to Eve? That's where I think he's hiding. That's where I'm pretty sure he is. Because my parents all came from Eve. I came from Eve. We inherited her sinful nature. It's in our DNA, people. Okay? Now, back to the two avenues of the immortals passing up and down from earth to heaven and from heaven to earth. Where in the world have you seen that before? This is all about the fake Jesus. Remember in Genesis 28, Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set, and he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. The ladder, do you get it? DNA. John, and who is that ladder? Not what is that ladder. Who is it? John 151. He saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Hallelujah. So, the devil paid attention to the details, didn't he? Because, now, again, he didn't put it all in one religion. He put some of it in this religion, some of it in this religion, some of it in that religion. Remember, it's like the pieces of Osiris that are scattered all over the earth. When you bring all of those pieces together, which is what Manly Hall did in Secret Teachings, then you get the puzzle pieces together, fit it together in the right place, and you've got yourself one pretty good-looking false Jesus. Because, he, remember, he said, the cave was adorned with the signs of the zodiac, and cancer being the gate of descent, Capricorn of ascent, these are the two avenues of the immortals passing up and down from earth to heaven and from heaven to earth. Where did he get that from? From the angels of God ascending and descending on the ladder, which was the Son of Man. And what is that ladder? It's the only way that you and I can get to 
heaven. This is the, this is the ladder. This is the Son of God. This is the Word of God who, who is Jesus. This is the light of the world. This Bible is it for us. You want to get to heaven? Believe this. Don't believe that other stuff. And that other stuff gets introduced into the churches pretty easily now. Why? Because people aren't reading the Bible. The devil paid attention to the Bible, but people didn't. The Son, we've talked about that, but unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. That's Malachi 4, 2, Psalm 19, 4. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the Son, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. They're all copying Jesus Christ. Now, here's what I see and why Psalm 19 calls the Son the bridegroom. Because, okay, so here's Jesus and he is the bridegroom. We are the bride. We're going to be joined with him for eternity one of these days. Marriage is a beautiful symbol of Christ and his church. What's the opposite of that? The sons of God, the fourth kingdom, literally in a perverted form of sacred marriage, mingling themselves with the seed of men. Just as Christ is joining to his church, these gods will join themselves in with the seed of mankind, pro producing a corrupt humanity on this earth, brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. Now, one more thing, and we'll close this out. Albert Pike basically did, in, in part of Morals and Dogma, what Manley Hall did with Secret Teachings. He realized this motto, well, we all worship the same God. And so he characterizes it this way in Morals and Dogma. To them, meaning the Aboriginal peoples, the sun was the innate fire of bodies, the fire of nature, author of life, heat, and ignition. He was to them the efficient cause of all generation, for without him there was no movement, no existence, no form. He was to them immense, indivisible, imperishable, and everywhere present. It was their need of light and of his creative energy that was felt by all men, and nothing was more fearful to them than his absence. His beneficent influences caused his identification with the principle of good and the Brahma of the Hindus, and Mithras of the Persians, Atom, Amun, Ptha, and Osiris of the Egyptians, the Bel of the Chaldeans, which is Baal, the Adonai of the Phoenicians, the Adonis and Apollo of the Greeks, became but personifications of the sun, the regenerating principle, image of that fecundity which perpetuates and rejuvenates the world's existence. It sounds like to me that the world has a God problem. They keep worshiping this God and they don't know who in the world he is. Well, he's... Osiris to these people, but he's not Osiris to these people over here. Over here, he's something else. When we send missionaries out to go preach the gospel, when I preach to the Kenyan people, I don't tell them that the God of their forefathers who were pagans, I don't tell them that their God really is Jesus Christ but they can keep calling him by the name of their old God. I don't do that. I don't, just because there are different people with a different culture and a different language and a different color and a different location, 
That doesn't mean that they can't know the real God. But that's how the devil did it. He scattered the Antichrist all throughout these religions, gave them all different names, and assumed that because, and, and believe it or not, I knew people in Christianity that believed we ought to leave when we minister to people in different cultures, different places of the world, that we ought to leave as much of their old religion intact in order to teach them Christ, because he was there. And I'm just going, oh no, we're here to bring them out of that, not leave them in it, and then just stamp another name on it. Paul ran into the same thing, remember that? In Acts 17, Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill, Mars was not a candy bar at that time. It was a god. And he said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and behold, beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. God, and, and notice here, now, Paul is going to, they had one sep, just in case we left a God out, which they did. We're going to say, this is to the unknown God, so we don't make him mad. And Paul's not going to say, well, he's Mars. He's not going to tell them that. He's going to remove them from their ignorance and convert them, or attempt to, to the one true God, Jesus Christ. That's what he's going to do. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needeth anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device, Think of the Triketra. And the times of this ignorant God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. So Paul's making it very clear. I'm not here to tell you to keep worshiping your gods. Just give him a different title. I'm here to tell you about the one you don't know about, you that you admit you don't know about. But I'm going to explain to you word for word who he is according to what the scripture says. Now it just so happens that apparently one of the poets said that we are his offspring. I don't know where he got it. But Paul used that because and, and, we know from the scripture that we are the offspring of God. Now, God is our father. We are sons of God, born again. And that's how Paul used to teach it to him. But he's given them scripture. And he says in Acts chapter 4, verse 10, Be it known unto you all, and to all, that was actually, this is Peter, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there was none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Somebody say amen. You see, what's happening now Here's the stone. And the builders of the 21st century churches are setting at naught 
the stone. And we're going back into a state, or let's say these churches are going back into a state where instead of worshiping the God that we can read everything about and know Him, back to an unknown God. A God who, as Joel Osteen said, Oprah says, is, are you saying that Jesus is the only way to God? Yes, Jesus is the only way to God, but there are many ways to Jesus. Well, there is. No, there isn't. One way. One faith. One baptism. One Lord. One way only. But w the churches are reverting back to this unknown God. You want to talk about a great reset? They're not just going to reset the economies of the world, and the governments of the world. They're going to reset Jesus Christ and eliminate these evil dogmas of the past and bring in a fresh new Christ that will be the man of sin, the son of perdition. That's where we're headed. The thing that hath been, which is what I've been showing you the last four weeks, the thing that hath been is that which shall be. And there is no new thing under what? The sun. Because the sun already knows all the things, doesn't he? And he's revealed, I love this. I love the fact that instead of looking up at night going, who is God? I can read this book and know him. Know him better than I know my wife. Know him better than I know my children. Know him better than I know myself. I'm glad I have that. And I'm also glad that we don't have to worship God in a cave somewhere. I just, the older I get, I just don't like caves all that much anymore. Anyway, you're the reason why we do what we do. This is Pastor Mike. God bless you. We love you. We'll start next time on the fake Jesus of the present. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.